Okay. Great tactic. I guess now we're ready. Uh, yeah, so my name is Falco Jude. I'm, uh, uh, I'm a scientist in the Mesoscale and Microscale Meteorology Laboratory. So I'm not a climate scientist. I'm coming from the weather side. And in particular, I'm a cyclone guy. So and I would like to thank uh, the organizers of this workshop, uh, Andreas and Roy, to, um, yeah, I would like to thank them to give me the opportunity to talk to this audience, even though I'm doing weather science. Um, this image here is uh, an image that's just uh, about a week old of Super Typhoon Jebby in the eastern, western Pacific. Uh, this outline here is the island of Guam. And to me, these tropical cyclones are the most awe-inspiring phenomena that our atmosphere creates. And uh, I want to show you, uh, using the examples of tropical cyclones, how far we have come in modeling the atmosphere. Um, just to go back to this particular example, so this was the equivalent of a Category 5 hurricane. Uh, we have uh, maximum wind speeds in this cyclone of uh, almost 80 meters per second. If you like kilometers per hour, that's 280 kilometers per hour for the mean wind speed. Uh, this typhoon actually made landfall in Japan and was the strongest typhoon in Japan in the last 25 years. So going back to the talk now, uh, I would like to use this opportunity to uh, convince you that global cloud resolving or convection permitting models offer a tremendous advantage over regional models. Namely, they get rid of the constraints of the lateral boundary conditions. If you think about it, regional models are kind of like uh, string puppets. You know, you're constrained to what you feed into the domain with the boundary conditions. And if you use a global model, you're getting rid of that. You're actually simulating the whole atmosphere, which is inherently global. So that's a tremendous advantage. And I hope I can convince you about that. Um, tropical cyclones are actually a good example, because tropical cyclones are global phenomena. Um, this is a map of the globe. And we have here the tracks of, tropical, of all tropical cyclones over about a 60-year period. And they're color-coded by intensity. So this is the commonly known Saffir-Simpson hurricane scale. It goes from hurricane one, which is the weakest hurricane, to category five, the strongest. And we can see tropical cyclones exist, exist uh, over the tropical oceans and the mid-latitude oceans almost anywhere, everywhere on the globe. And there are a few hot spots, like here in the Western Pacific, where we have the most strongest and strongest tropical cyclones on, glo on the globe. And we also have the Eastern Pacific Basin here. And then look at that. This is usually what we hear in the news about. In the Atlantic, this is where the hurricanes occur. But this basin is actually, uh, on average, much less active. And there's a little bit of uh, activity in the Southern Hemisphere, too. So I hope this figure convinces you that to really study tropical cyclones, we should go to a global domain. Now, tropical cyclones are inherently multi-scale. And that's why we need high resolution to model them. So to understand this better, I want to go a little bit into the physics and energetics of tropical cyclones. So this is a cutout here of a tropical cyclone, or TC. And tropical cyclones are creatures of the warm ocean. They're essentially heat engines that pick up heat from the warm tropical ocean surface, release the energy in the clouds, and convert that heat energy into wind speed, into momentum. So it's like an engine in a car. This is the fuel, the hot ocean. And then it spins up the winds, creates tremendous winds. And then we have the spent air, the exhaust, is going out here at the, at the top of the uh, troposphere. Now, the energy is released in the rain bands, and in particular in the eye wall which is surrounding the calm eye. So these are actually convective processes. So tropical cyclones are about hundreds to 1,000 kilometers across, but all the action, all the energy release actually happens on convective scales. So they're a prime example of multi-scale weather systems. And we actually need high resolution, uh, less than five kilometers, to really accurately model these processes. So again. Tropical cyclones exist, exist globally, 
but they're driven by convective processes which require higher resolution. So they're very good examples for global convection permitting models. Uh, I want to demonstrate this, the resolution aspect, with this figure here. In the top left, we see a radar image of Hurricane Rita of 2005. Here we see the eye, the eye wall, and the rain bands. And this image was taken by a Hurricane Hunter aircraft that was crisscrossing the storm to investigate its intensity. Now, in our group in, uh, at the University of Miami, where I was a grad student, uh, we ran war simulations of this exact hurricane. And what we can tell here is, using different resolutions, we get very different pictures. Starting with 15 kilometers, we get something that looks like a tropical cyclone, but I, I would argue this is not a tropical cyclone. Now, when you go to five kilometers, you actually can see now there is an eye wall, and there's rain bands, and there's a gap in between. So we're actually getting closer to what observations show us. Now, I would like to remind you this is reflectivity here, and this is accumulated rainfall, so there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. But we really, when we go to 1.67 kilometer grid spacing, that's when we can really tell, OK, now we get a nice eye wall, rain bands, convective cells in the rain bands. So the whole point is we really have to go to convection permitting grid spacing to accurately, accurately simulate the convection and simulate the whole storm. OK, um, just a little bit on the side, because I'm a weather person, I like to talk about how we forecast hurricanes to this day or at this point. Uh, in the US, it's the National Hurricane Center in Miami that, that predicts the hurricanes. And they essentially use a two-step approach. They use global models to look at where tropical cyclones will form and where they might go. Now, these global models have grid spacings now. We know the GFS is about 13 kilometers. The ECMWF is 9 kilometers. So they're not really convection permitting. They still run with cumulus parameterization schemes. So we can't really rely on the, uh, on the fidelity of how the tropical cyclones look in the global models. That's why forecasters use regional models as well. They run in parallel with the global models. And they're just like your regional climate models. Just a box, and then we have vortex following domains here so that the hurricane always stays inside the domain with the highest resolution. So these domains actually move with the hurricane. And nowadays, the resolution of the innermost domain is about one to two kilometers. So in my opinion, this um, double track approach is not really good. First of all, we get some information from a global model, some information from a regional model, but these are different models. So the forecasters say the hurricane will go this way based on the global model, and will have this intensity based on the regional model, which may have a different track. So there is something that's not really fitting well together. And in, in the worst case, that can lead to very inconsistent forecasts. And in the least case, it's scientifically inelegant, right? To use two models that are different for the purpose of simulating or forecasting one event. So I think this is where our work comes in. We combine the best of two worlds, global geometry and high resolution. Now, we couldn't do this because computers weren't fast enough. That's the whole reason why we use this awkward setting of two models. But now, we're actually getting to the point where we can use global convection permitting models to go to a single track approach. And if you're from NCAR, you know we like single track. Uh, yeah, so this approach is probably at least five years away. Uh, at least five, probably more like 10 years uh, for the operational forecasting community. But nonetheless, so we can already do it here in research mode. And uh, for the rest of the talk, I would like to present some results from a global convection permitting simulation, a 20-day long simulation uh, that we did with the model for prediction across scales. So it's this global model on an unstructured mesh. And for this particular case, it's, the mesh has a spacing of four kilometers, so nice and convection permitting. 55 
five vertical levels. The model top is at 30 kilometers. And I use error interim conditions to initialize the model. But remember, we don't need lateral boundary conditions. You just initialize it as the whole globe, so there is no need for lateral boundary conditions. And this was initialized on October 19, 2012. Uh, the model is, is spun up for 24 hours simply because error interim has 75 kilometer data. And so we want to let the model spin up the mesoscales and the weather system by itself we, before we do any analysis. Um, I'm showing this figure here, which looks like it's a map, a topographic map of the US. But it's, in fact, straight from the model. Uh, each pixel here is a grid point of the elevation. And this probably looks very similar to uh, the Konos runs, the Wurf Konos runs. But the Wurf Konos runs end here, whereas this is the whole globe. OK, so a few words about the parameterizations. It's what we call the convection permitting um, suite. So in, in our laboratory now, we don't want to switch income, uh, per, uh, physics per packages, switch them out. Uh, WORF has about 80 of them, so that's too many. So we're coming up with suites that are, uh, are really good for a particular grid spacing or a particular event you want to predict. So in this case, the microphysics is Thomson scheme. There is a convection scheme here, but it's only the shallow uh, part that's activated of the Grell Freitas. The boundary layer scheme is the MYNN. Land surface and radiation scheme are pretty standard what we use uh, for um, weather forecasting type cases. OK. Uh, I hope the animations work. Let's take a look what this four, kilom four kilometer MPAS simulation produces. Looks almost like the real thing, right? So this is, looks like a satellite uh, animation, but it's actually the model. So we see the convection here in the ITCZ. Uh, North and South America are rotating out of the way. See multi-scale features here in these extratropical cyclones. Now the Pacific warm pool is coming into view with lots of convection. And here we see tropical cyclones. There's one making landfall in Vietnam. There's another one here. And so we just ran it. And similar to what Ethan was talking about yesterday, we didn't really run it for the tropical cyclones. They just happened to be there. The model happens to boost them. So I will show you how the model did. And before I do that, I would like to show a little bit more eye candy to really whet your appetite what these models are, are capable of doing. So on the left here, this is the 10 meter wind speed of a North Atlantic extratropical cyclone. So your classic uh, North Atlantic winter storm. And the coloring is 10 meter wind speed. So we see all these details here, which is actually convective features that current generations of models, global models, don't have. Now the, this cyclone is spinning down. There's a new frond coming off of the North American continent. And look at all these small scale features. There's little vortices that form here along the front. There's a tip jet developing here, southwest of Greenland. So there's tremendous detail that we weren't able to, to simulate so far. Um, another thing that's really great about convection permitting models is they simulate the diurnal cycle really well. This is South America. And you see the cold pools developing from the convection. So now it's night. This is two meter temperature. Now it's day. And in the afternoon, you see those cold pools developing. So that's really neat. I'll show it again, because there's a few other features to point out. So basically, surface temperature in the afternoon, you have the convective development. Then at night, it quiets down, warms up again, boom, convection. Now you can even see the Amazon here. So the model can actually see the Amazon River. It, it's that high resolution and the thermal inertia of the, uh, of the big river. Now, the talk is about tropical cyclones. So let's take a look at a particular typhoon, which was Santin. This is outgoing long wave radiation, so we're looking at clouds. Here are the Philippines, here's Vietnam. It's moving into the South China Sea, very favorable conditions. It increases in intensity, de develops a nice eye, becomes an archetypical tropical cyclone, makes landfall and dissipates. So just like the real thing. And it's really nice when we look at the 
10 meter wind speed. So this is what we uh, hurricane scientists are interested in. That's the variable we like to forecast, the 10 meter wind speed. The tropical storm, it's still weak here, moving through the Philippines. It's interacting with all these islands. And you see all the small scale det uh, details in the wind field. And we see the mountains are blocking the wind and there's some uh, shadowing going on here. TC spins up and crashes at category three intensity into Vietnam. Now it spins down. So it almost looks like, this almost looks like a wharf uh, simulation except that it's global. And uh, this is just one example. So how did the model do if we integrate over the whole globe over the whole time period? So as I said, we could only afford to run this for 20 days. Now that's not very long. Uh, but that's what we're interested in on weather time scales. During this 20-day period, October, November 2012, there were five actual tropical cyclones, among them infamous Sandy with a left hook into New Jersey. And then these, uh, this is a typhoon, Santin. This is two cyclones in the, uh, one is in the Arabian Sea here, Murjan, and then Nilam in the Bay of Bengal. So we know, and there's a weaker one, Rosa, here. So we know there were five cyclones. How did MPAS do, the four kilometer MPAS? Ooh. It produced about a lot more TCs. And here's the table with the statistics. So we had one, one hit in the North Atlantic. It did produce Sandy. It completely went off the wrong track, so it was out, a out to lunch there. But look at what happens here in the Pacific. Uh, we have a lot of false alarms. In the Central Atlantic, uh, there were actually no TCs observed, zero and zero. So zero hits, zero misses, but six uh, false alarms. So there's something with the model that produces too many tropical cyclones. And let me pause here briefly and uh, bring back the point of observational uncertainty. The thing, I'm more and more convinced that we don't really know how many tropical cyclones there actually are in this area. There are few, there's very few data points. So we can trust the Atlantic, the West Pacific, but what's going on here, we don't really know. So I just wanna, I want you to keep that in mind. It's, it looks like the model is really bad, but who knows how good are our observations? And I'll come back to that later. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna show you three case studies. Now it goes basically from the good to the bad to the ugly. Uh, Typhoon Santin is the good case. Uh, this is the track again in black, the observations in red, the MPAS model has a pretty good track. Now these are time series of the intensity. This is the maximum 10 meter wind speed. Observations, it increases in intensity and then it weakens as the storm landfalls. And MPAS does pretty much the same thing. Now this is about eight, nine day forecast. That's very good for a forecast model that it basically reproduces the intensity evolution. And the same for the minimum central pressure, which is another metric that we evaluate tropical cyclones by. So this is a really good case. Um, a few words about verifying the model. What I showed you here is essentially point observations estimates of its intensity. But I wasn't really happy because I don't know how good those observations are. So I looked at wind field analyses. I was like, is there a global data set that shows us the 10 meter wind speed? Well, there is, but it has trouble. So this is the analysis, the observations. I wouldn't call it really observations now. And this is the model. So it looks like the model is way stronger than the observations, but again, we cannot trust these observations. It's, it's, it has a model background field with observations, buoy observations, but if there aren't any, it really cannot tell how strong the winds are. And then another issue is with the rainfall. Again, I wanted to look at how did the model do? Well, the model produced this, and TRIM, the satellite, saw this. It looks different. This looks much more blobby in the TRIM field. Uh, there's a bit of a tracy of the tropical cyclone as it moved. This is an integration over the whole lifetime of the TC. But here we, know, we see it rained much more continuously. Uh, in, to boil it down to one number, this is 7.0 kilometers squared of rainfall. That's, I think I computed that in gallons, it's about four trillion. 
And the model was in the right ballpark, a little bit more. But again, how much can we trust these observations? I think there was a talk on Tuesday that said, well, if you look at TREM or Seymour over Africa, you get very different results. Um, now let's go to the ugly. Cyclonic storm Mourjan. Well, there was a tropical cyclone here in the observations as well as in the model, but whoa, the model thought it's going to be a category three hurricane equivalent, whereas in reality it was a weak, wimpy tropical storm. So the model did see there was a tropical storm developing, but it way overdid the intensity. And we see the same when we look at our gridded uh, analyses and observations. So the gridded observations are way weaker than what MPAS produced. Same with the rainfall. It only had a little rainfall, but the model way overdid the rainfall. And I think now we can tell, or now we can say the model is actually not doing what reality did. And going to the ugly now, which is uh, a case of what we call a phantom cane, a hurricane that only exists in the model. So this is a false alarm. So the MPAS thought there was going to be a tropical cyclone that became quite intense, 120 knots or 65 meters per second. But in reality, there was nothing. And we see that when we look at the gridded observations again. There is a weak circulation over India. And there is an actual very strong tropical cyclone in the model with a lot of rain that did not exist. So this is uh, definitely a case where the model produces too much or too many and too strong tropical cyclones. This is one of the examples. Uh, another way to evaluate how good the model is is looking at the so-called pressure-wind relationship or wind-pressure relationship. Uh, this dates back to the days when we wanted to know how strong the hurricanes are. Uh, we flew planes, or not we, but they flew planes, and they could estimate the central pressure in the eye much better than the winds around it. So they came up with a relationship, uh, how low is the minimum sea level pressure in the eye, how strong will the winds be? And the black dots here is what we gather from the observations of the five storms I showed you in the overview. And the red dots is what MPAS produced. So ideally, we would want those two clouds of dots to overlap. Then we could say that mo the model produces what the observations show. Turns out that the wind pressure relationship in the model is somewhat off. So the model produces tropical cyclones that do not fully agree in structure in the winds and pressure with what uh, the real world showed us. If we can trust the observations, there's always this if. Yeah. And with that, I'd like to come to this slide. So I did this, and I said, oh, the model is bad. The model has too many tropical cyclones and too strong. And then I'm, I'm more and more convinced that we cannot really trust our data sets. Because how do we get the observations? Well, there's buoys. There's very few buoys over the global oceans. Uh, in the Atlantic, we use research and uh, operational aircraft that fly into the hurricanes before they make landfall. But not every hurricane in the Atlantic makes landfall. And it's expensive, but this is probably the best observations we, we get around here, around um, the, the North Atlantic. And then there are satellites that work globally. But again, the estimates and intensity you get from the satellites are questionable. Uh, so I think we can boil it down to that the number of weak TCs in the global data sets is underestimated. Now, there's no way to prove that. It's just a hunch that I think I have. Then there, the intensity estimates are very uncertain, except for the storms that are uh, patrolled by aircraft. And then the gridded analyses, they just lack the resolution. So the gridded analyses that I showed you were 25 kilometers, and I'm coming with a four kilometer model. There is a mismatch there, which makes it hard to, to give you an apples to apples comparison. So the bottom line, it's really difficult to uh, evaluate the models. So our models are getting better and better, and we don't really have the observations that are good enough to evaluate them. I think that's one of the points that we, as a community, should think about. Um, yeah, now a few scatterbrained notes that I noticed as I went through the model results. Um, I saw this in the four kilometer MPAS run. It's been seen in other runs too. The models are really lacking the diversity 
of the real world. And for lack of a better analogy, I want to show you these two pictures. So imagine these flowers are tropical cyclones. Well, in the model world, there's maybe two kinds. All tropical cyclones look alike in the model or very similar. And in the real world, we have differences in size, differences in structure that the model does not really reproduce. So the model is lacking creativity. Or it has a lower dimensional attractor. I don't know how you want to phrase it, but I'm pretty sure other people see that too in the models. And I don't really know what it means or uh, yeah, how we can uh, get the model world closer to reality. And then the TCs appear too convective. So they're essentially, since it's convection permitting, um, there's strong convection in the eye wall and the rain bands. But in reality, tropical cyclones actually have tremendous stratiform rain areas, which convection permitting models do not reproduce well. And we know these are important for the dynamics of the storm. So we're clearly not there yet with convection permitting modeling to really get a, a very faithful representation of tropical cyclone. Uh, with that, at long, I'd like to come to the conclusions. So I hope I could convince you that instead of having this awkward two-pronged approach, if we use global convection permitting models, we can in principle predict the tracks of tropical cyclones, the intensity, and all the meteorological hazards as a one-stop one shop, essentially. Just run one model and get all these things that we need to warn the people. Uh, the current generation of global convec convection permitting models, which is kind of generation 0.1, uh, produces too many, too strong, and too uniform TCs. Uh, I saw this in the MPAS simulations, and the GFDL folks are running uh, very large nests that are almost global. They see it too. But again, there's this caveat. It's only relative to observations. I don't think we can say the observations are truth. And but maybe for you guys here in the climate community, I think global convection permitting model climate simulations can really reduce the amount of uncertainty with respect to how climate change affects tropical cyclones. So I get this question a lot. How would climate change affect TCs? And what we know from models is, well, these models are coarse resolution. They're GCMs. Uh, convection is parameterized, so there's a huge uncertainty simply because these convective parameterizations are, are so prone to inducing errors. So if we go to convection permitting climate simulations, we're removing a whole chunk of uncertainty. Now, there is still uncertainty with other physics schemes, but at least we're moving beyond this, uh, the, the uncertainty introduced by the convective parameterization scheme. So with that, I'd like to close. And if there's time for questions or comments, I'm happy to take those.